Good evening, everybody. What a fantastic turnout. Um, please excuse us as we bring some more chairs down. We hadn't quite anticipated the pool of our wonderful guest speaker tonight, so there will be a few more chairs arriving if you could bear with us. It gives me very great pleasure to introduce this lecture to you tonight. I'd like to say a few welcomes first. First of all, to the members of Grayson's family who've traveled here. I'd like to say thank you to Jill Westwood and Michael Keary, who approached us, I think a little less than a week ago, about hosting this talk. Jill's a lecturer in art history in the School of Applied Social and Human Sciences in the University of, of Western Sydney, and is a, a, long for, a long standing friend of Grayson. So we're very grateful to the University of Western Sydney for its support. Michael Keary is an artist and senior lecturer in the School of Contemporary Arts at UWS. He's also known to many of you as the chair of NAVA, the National Association for the Visual Arts, which has done so much to promote the rights of individual artists in Australia. So I'd like to thank NAVA for their support as well. Judging by the turnout, we've really hit a nerve here. I was thinking earlier about the show we have upstairs. We have the wonderful Bridget Riley, who has been described as the grand dame of British painting. And here we have tonight another dame, Grayson Perry. Grayson, of course, rocketed to fame, I would say, when he won the prestigious, or perhaps more uh, also known as the notorious Turner Prize in London at the, at the Tate Gallery in 2003. And of course, was immediately picked up by the press, uh, delighting in his persona, as well as, of course, his extraordinary provocative artwork. He's previously said that a lot of his work has always had a guerrilla tactic, a stealth tactic, I want to make something that lives with the eye as a beautiful piece of art, but on closer inspection, a polemic or an ideology will come out of it. And having seen Grayson Perry's Potts' wonderful artworks myself, I can fully endorse that that is precisely what happens. It's a rather unnerving experience. You see this extraordinary object, but as you approach it and realize what is inscribed upon it, it, it makes you rethink again and almost do a double take. He's also said that he's not a potter, he's an artist who choose to make pots. He's exhibited in London at the Victoria Miro Gallery. He's just completed a film for Channel 4 in the UK on transvestitism. He's staying briefly in Australia, sadly. I was hoping he might be able to stay longer. But he's on his way to New Zealand, where he's part of a very interesting group show at Auckland Art Gallery entitled Mixed Up Childhood. His visit to New Zealand is being supported by the British Council. Jill Westwood said to us when she rang us up, I'm sure Grayson will be a very entertaining speaker. He is, of course, one of the rising stars of the British art scene. He's broken the traditional mold of ceramic artists and his work make powerful statements, challenging thoughts and stereotypes. I think that's enough from me. I'd just like to say a very big welcome, Grayson Perry. Thank you. Dolly. Wow, I'm really impressed with the turnout. I'm in uh, a bit overwhelmed, really. And thank you, Dizanne, for that lovely introduction. You've, you've, said, you've made all the thank yous that I would want to make myself to MCA and to Jill and the University of Western uh, Sydney. And so I'll just get straight to the point and uh, say thank you for coming. And I'm going to talk um, about the, my whole career here, because maybe there's some of you here that I hope have never seen anything that I've done. So I'll start right at the beginning. And here is me and my sister. The, the lights seem a bit bright. Is it, is it, can it all right? Yeah, you can see all right. Okay. This is me and my sister in about 1965. And uh, I want to talk about the first pot I ever made, which is this one. <laughs> this is the, what I would call the Edo tea bowl of my personal life culture. I often like to think of myself as a one-person culture, and this is a kind of crucial uh, artifact from its archaeology. Uh, I made this when I was eight, uh, a sort of ashtray for my mother. And um, when I was making it, we had to wear these kind of rubberized smocks. And we had a very pretty teacher who looked a bit like Dusty Springfield. And as she was snapping it up, my back, the snappers, uh, it was a bit tight. And I got quite turned on by it. And so I made my first ever pot in a state of sort of sexual arousal, aged eight. But I'm not saying this had any bearing on my later work. <laughs> 
And I want to talk about my work this evening through the medium of this recent piece, which is called A Map of an Englishman. I'll just get it into focus. Um, one of my passions at the moment is large print. This is quite a large print. It's 60 by 45 inches. And I wanted to make it the kind of thing that a country house has hanging in the lavatory. One of those artworks you could go back to again and again. And it's basically a map of my mind. So I want to talk about the, my work sort of by travelling about the regions of my mind, really. So we'll start in the middle with the capital city, which is sex. Um, it's just over the bridge from love, you'll be glad to know. But um, uh, sex does, I mean, I, I was getting this out of the way, really, because I think sex is terribly overrated uh, as a kind of subject for artwork, maybe. But um, so here, here we have sex. So I thought I'd go back to when I was at art college and when I first started making art that kind of leads on to what I do now. And I, I think up till the second year I was at art college, I treated art like a sort of nine to five job, which is a terrible thing to do because art, for me, be is best sort of lived. And this is a piece I made called, called Transvestite Jet Pilots. It's a dressing table carved to look like an aircraft cockpit in a crude sort of neo-expressionist style. Um, and it has kind of some uh, sort of crude sort of caveman dressing table set on the top of it. And it's kind of like a clash of gender roles that kind of echoes right the way through my entire oeuvre, really. In the bottom drawer, there were this series of photographs of sort of me transmogrifying into uh, Michelangelo's David. I'm just trying to get this. There we are. And it kind of, then there's me at a kind of Oxfam Lille on the right-hand side here. Um, and I think what exemplifies something about transvestism, I call transvestism a kind of archaeology of sexism. It's sort of uh, a, a, my reaction, if you like, against the kind of sexual stereotype that is offered at, to me as a male child. The, here's the male role that you might want to you know, participate in, and I wasn't really going to have any of it. And so I, I kind of had to kind of uh, exile a large amount of my feeling to, the, to, the, to an island, which I now visit, and that island's transvestism, if you like. And so the images of jet planes, which are, uh, I regard, because my father was in the uh, RAF, and so the, the, the jet plane for me is very much a sort of symbol of masculinity. Um, and uh, a few years ago I was in an Oxfam shop and I found this pile of air model, radio control model aeroplane magazines. And every one on the cover had this, the, the modeler's wife holding their jet <laughs> for scale, I imagine. And she'd always have her best earrings and a bit of lippy on. You know, and it'd always be in some bleak recreation ground in the middle of nowhere. And I just like these images of this sort of these women sort of slightly dolled up, holding the aeroplane. So I made this aeroplane. My daughter calls it the girls' aeroplane because it's quite. It has like little puppies on it instead of um, sort of roundels, and uh, it's very decorative. But the image of the jet plane crops up and again and again as as masculine. This is a detail from a recent piece called um, Precious Boys. Um, and it has these aeroplanes sort of like, uh, almost like shoals of fish swimming under the, the current. And then towards the top is this very detailed, lavish, uh, textured images of transvestites. Um, almost like they're like the kind of lily pads floating on the surface of the, of the, of the world. And the jet planes are like the fish sort of um, in shoals floating about under the surface. Very decorative piece, um, based on a piece of Japanese satsuma wear. Um, again, it's that kind of, cr I think, because transvestism by its very nature, we have a very polar idea of gender, very black and white. And of, of course, people would offer you that, you know, we, we, now we live in times now where a much more fluid idea, idea of gender is available to young people nowadays. But I don't know if it quite works like that. I think there's something about, um, our minds that love to grasp onto the very kind of uh, polar, the black and white idea of, of subjects, a kind of intellectualization. The, carrying on the theme of the sort of jet plane, this is a pop called Look Mum, I'm a Jet Pilot, because my mother used to have a fantasy that I would join the RAF, <laughs> and, uh, which wasn't so unrealistic in those days. And I would, 
turn up one day in a sports car with a white scarf flying out behind me like some sort of cliché RAF pilot and whisk her off to a rose-covered cottage and rescue her. Um, so I made this vase about her, really, because this was kind of like the nearest um, I thought that I would ever get to being a jet pilot, was to make a pot about jets. Um, going back to the map again, we come to the area called Bloke. Because actually, like I was saying about this polarised idea of a gender, I am quite a blokey bloke, you know, when I'm being a bloke. <laughs> So we've got up the top here, we've got a kind of all those kind of terrible cliches that blokes come out with, like, at the end of the day, you know, and frankly, like, when, when somebody says to you, can I be honest, you know, I always think, you mean you're not the rest of the time? And that, that, you know, I, that's a hateful thing to say, I think, and with due respect, you know you're about to be insulted, don't you? <laughs> but you know those blokes. And here's a picture of me being very blokey, like an alien landed on planet Biker. These are my motorbike levers. They're based on the Cern Abyss Giant, which is a, um, a hill figure in Dorset in, um, in, uh, in England. And uh, I, have, I, I base my levers on that. So I'm a big biker fan. And this is another early piece from I made when I was at college. This is the crown of the penii. So it's got sort of phallic images all the way around it. This is a bronze crown based on a kind of old English medieval crown. And this is a fairly recent, uh, no, not comparatively recent piece. Um, a, a, a while ago, I was asked to participate in an exhibition um, that was uh, all about computerized embroidery. Uh, and so I had access to th this technology. And um, this, was, this, I, this was a piece I made subsequently because I really liked the process. This is a, a large sort of quilt. It's about eight feet square. And it's called a tree, The Tree of Death. And um, we've got a close-up slide of it here. Here's one of the panels. And it's basically, bot it's basically uh, a series of sort of penises ejaculating up assholes all the way across it in a kind of pattern, repeat pattern. Um, and then there's vein needles going into veins and um, uh, sort of various little pink coffins and things. So it's kind of about AIDS, I suppose, because it was about the time when the AIDS quilts. This is kind of like how you get AIDS quilt. But it's very lavish, and it's based on kind of Japanese kimono fabric, so it's nice, nice colours. Keeping on the phallic theme, because this is, uh, you know, something that I'd want to, to, to get out of the way. This is a, this is a piece, that's, it's back to front of the slide, unfortunately. Um, this is called Portrait of Anthony Doffe. He was my art dealer at the time, and he collected these lingam, these Hindu uh, sculptures that they have in the temple, the lingam. And, uh, so I made this as a portrait of him, which is like these two lingam. One represents his spirituality, and that's the list of the, the artists that he represented at the time. And the other one represents his good business sense, so it was the top 20 stocks on the stock market. <laughs> and it looked like a giant cruet set when I made it as well, which I don't know if that has any relevance to it. But anyway, so that's my portrait of Anthony Doffe. Um, this is a pot called Moonlit Wankers. Uh, masturbation is terribly underrated, I think. Self-dating, as we call it. And uh, this was sort of commemorating a particularly good wank I'd had once. And I wanted, I wanted to kind of... Um, it was in a, the grounds of a mansion in a lovely moonlit scene with the dewy grass, you know. And so I wanted to kind of commemorate that. So, and, and to kind of romanticise the whole idea, because often it's sort of seen as a seedy thing. I mean, anybody who's got a computer with a left-handed mouse you know, knows what I'm talking about. It. Um, so this is my pot that kind of romanticises the idea of masturbation. Because a lot of people, you know, they kind of poo-poo it. I like it. And this is my, this is my trademark, by the way. Uh, this is relevant, uh, if you read it carefully. Um, it also makes reference to the Chelsea pottery in, uh, in England, which was a 17th century porcelain manufacturer, so it's a sort of historical connection. Continuing again on the phallic thing, I'll, I'll bore of this in a minute. Um, this is a close-up of a pot called uh, uh, Fatherland, and I wanted this idea of a kind of rustic worship of the phallus, and like if we had the phallus was as common an image as, say, as a crucifix, and so we've got pollarded trees in the shape of trees, bread in the shape of phallus, 
um, church in the shape of a phallus, chimneys in the shape of a phallus. I think there's cars and boats and everything's in the shape of a phallus. It's like the whole of this culture is phallic shaped on this vase. And this is a detail of my coming out dress. Because um, I was asked to be in this exhibition that was about ritual. And as a transvestite, I thought, well, the obvious ritual thing is not a pot, though that's what I mainly do. So I made a dress. I had, uh, this is a, an embroidered willy. And I wanted to make the willy a kind of friendly, less threatening thing. Because I think the, the penis gets a very bad press. <laughs> and I wanted to kind of decriminalise the penis, really. And so I made a nice cuddly little penis that looks like a little bunch of strawberries or something, you know. And, it's, and they're all over the dress. And there's, all, there's me in my coming out dress. And I did a little performance uh, and, and made a little speech and everything. And um, the, it all, it's all covered with images sort of documenting various aspects of my past. This is the Sir Nabis, going back to Sir Nabis again, this is Sir Nabis teddy bear. So he's kind of like a mixture of a kind of angry ancient Celtic god, children's toy, and he's kind of like the ghost of childhood, come back for revenge. And he's on the dress because uh, he represents my teddy bear, Alan Measles, which I think is on the next slide, there he is, on a vase. That's the real Alan Measles, he was my teddy bear, and he was kind of like my surrogate father. And I, what I did, I projected all of my positive male kind of ideas of masculinity onto him for safe for safekeeping, if you see what I mean. Because I felt that at the time, this is all subconscious, I didn't do it, you know, with awareness or whatever. But at the time I projected all my male maleness onto him. So he was like the leader of my imaginary world. And I'll talk more about that in it later on, but I just want now we're going to go on to this is part of the my mind, the dream, the island of dreams here. Um, because dreams are what Freud calls the royal road to the subconscious. So that I find them very interesting uh, looking at my I've always looked at my dreams quite closely. And this is a piece of work I made that is just a complete uh, transcription of a dream. I dreamt this very thing and I made it. It's a bronze Tang Dynasty racing car with the word dad on the side of it. <laughs> You know, it's, it's like a dream symbol. And I often used to dream old cars as my father, you know. Kind of nice looking, but a bit useless. You know, the idea of a father was nice, but, you know, in practice they were not very functional. <laughs> um, so this was my idea of a father. And I made this piece because I was asked to do a sculpture in the garden of his house in France. And so I, I was, I've always been interested in folk culture. And so what I wanted to say to... I don't know how over here, how you are, how much you know about the idea of Essex. But Essex is kind of like, the only parallel I have for it is like New Jersey in America. It's the kind of New Jersey of Britain, you know, where kind of low rent people live. And, you know, they're a bit on the make, they wear too much gold, you know, no tights in winter, too flashy a car, those sort of people. So this was my shrine to Essex man. And I wanted the people of France to think that we had a folk culture in Essex. <laughs> and that on every street corner, you know, every time there was a, a corner of a street or something, there'd be a little shrine like this to a car crash or something like that. <laughs> and so I made this shrine with the car in it and a little pot and little offerings to it. Uh, and then I made it into this photograph. Like, you remember those old encyclopedias? <laughs> When I was little, I learned to read from those old encyclopedias that always had a sepia photograph showing how, what are they up to in Bongo Wongo land, you know. <laughs> and that's me and my daughter visiting the shrine to Essex Man. Because <laughs> folk art is something that I'm really interested in. Because, uh, again, I, I, you know, I like to think of myself as a kind of one-person culture. Like the map is like the land where all that culture comes from. And this is a piece of work, this is a piece, not my piece of work, this is a piece, an artefact that I really like, I've got at home, it's um, uh, an Afghan prayer mat. And I love the fact it's got this Kalashnikov, they're from the, when the Russians were, it was the Russians' turn to invade Afghanistan a few years ago, you remember. And um, I think it says such a lot, you know, they're kind of, uh, they're sort of a prayer mat with a Kalashnikov on it. I really, really like it. There's, they do other ones with maps and with helicopters and gunships. And this was my kind of, um, response to that artefact. It's a pot called The Names of Flowers, and it lists all the wars that, I'd, that had happened in my lifetime uh, up until I made it. And um, I, I sort of thought of 
when you get those seed catalogues with kind of pretentious names for the different flowers, you know, like the Lady Diana Rose or Beaufort or, you know, uh, ice cream or something, you know, they always have a sort of some funny pretentious name. So I named all the patterns of flowers after, um, after wars because it seemed like a poetic combination. Um, <laughs> this is me wearing my mother of all battles costume. <laughs> this was the piece I made for the show when I was asked to do computer embroidery because I was thinking of what is a repository for embroidery that is very traditional, it's a folk costume and I've always liked the dirndl look. So I couldn't resist it. And I quite like the fact that Claire, you know, she's, she looks like the waitress from a kind of harvester restaurant. I don't know if you have harvester restaurants over here, but they're kind of um, pretend rural. <laughs> and these are the, all the motifs are based on war. So we've got an Israeli bus bomb motif. So it's like, I find these images quite disturbing because the nature of embroidery is that it's sort of, embroidery is kind of about love because of all the time and attention you put into doing a piece of embroidery and yet they're quite harsh images. So it's like the combination I find, still, I still find these images quite disturbing to look at. I think I wonder if I stepped over the mark a bit when I made this piece because they're quite kind of, um, the combination of the millions of stitches and the imagery is quite, of a, is quite a clash. So I still find for myself that I, I'm a bit kind of disturbed by these pictures. And it was, I made this at the time of the Bosnian conflict, um, which was about ethnic identity very much. And so it was this idea that they're actually fighting about their folk costumes and the power of that ethnic identity. And this is another piece about, this was my response to 9-11. This is the Dolge at Dungeless um, on the 11th of September. And um, I was halfway through this part when I heard about the 9-11 uh, thing. And um, so I just changed the subject. I didn't sort of make a special part about 9-11. I just made this part about 9-11. Uh, and what happened is I just, I just made speech bubbles. I just put speech bubbles onto everything that, um, that in, in, the, in the thing. So that guy's saying, no more beards. And it's all the kind of prejudice that was flying about just after 9-11 and all the kind of ridiculousness like, our prostitutes are best, one says. Um, it was all, you know, the kind of hypocrisy. We've, we've now got a world that is enthralled to two groups of people who think their beliefs are facts. You know, we've got Christian fundamentalists on one side and we've got Islamic fundamentalists on the other side. And, uh, you know, my invisible friend says things that are better than your invisible friend, you know, and I kind of go, oh, get over it, you know. <laughs> Here we go on to Abu Ghraib. This was a picture that I just bring out that's kind of relevant because it does look like one of those photographs from Abu Ghraib. I'm the one on the top right with a bell round his testicles. Um, we used to do nude performance. I was in a group called the Neo Naturists. And um, we, used to, we, we took the kind of tedium and pretentiousness of uh, performance art into nightclubs. And uh, we bought, got away with it because we were in the nude a lot of the time. And, uh, this, I just put this picture in because it did seem like one of those pictures from Abbott Grave. On the theme of war as well, I mean, war for me is a particularly relevant thing because it's, a, you know, as a child I used it as a metaphor for what was going on in my house. It was like about invasion. And so, you know, uh, my stepfather was the Germans in my imaginary world. And uh, Henry Darger, my favourite artist, he had a similar kind of metaphor, metaphor that in his work, you know, the kind of storm of his childhood was represented by war and weather. This is a detail from a pop called Us versus Us. But this is a picture by Henry Darger. It's not a very good slide, unfortunately. Um, he's a, an outsider artist who um, nobody knew he was an artist when, until he died in about 1972. And they cleared out his flat and um, Luckily, the person, his landlord, who cleared out his flat was a, a, a photographer and recognised the quality of the work that he was finding. And he found this 19,000-page book that was basically this, this huge, long story of this imaginary world, of this planet where there was this child slave rebellion. And uh, he, was always, he was obsessed with Catholicism, with the civil, American Civil War, with weather. And these seven, um, and here's a picture of the actual books um, that they found in his uh, studio, or his room. He slept in his chair in front of the desk where he made all these things. And uh, most of them are quite kind of, um, 
He traced all the images from uh, children's comics of the time. Right, I mean, he was working right from the 20s right through up until the, uh, the 70s. And um, a lot of them are quite innocuous sort of scenes, but there's a kind of broodingness about them that's very interesting. And some of them are terribly violent, and people thought that he was a suppressed paedophile when they found them. But on his gravestone it says, Henry Darger, artist and protector of children which is, I think is a very touching uh, epitaph for him. And now he's an absolute superstar of the outsider world because he's, he's that person untouched by the terrible uh, awareness, self-awareness and sophistication of the art world. And I think that for me, what for me he illustrates is that creative urge with no outside influence. He made these works only for himself. These are the seven heroines of the story, the, the Vivian girls. They led the child slave rebellion. And um, you know, I think that for me, the struggle of being an artist is the fact that we have this impulse to make things, and yet I also have to deal with the fact that it's in the context of the art world, and I have to deal with that somehow, which I'll show you how I deal with it later on. This is a very old drawing of mine. Um, I used to do a lot of collages myself, and I've spent a lot of my time, technically, as a ceramic artist, trying to replicate the look of my drawings and collages I used to do. And it's taken me a long time to build up the kind of uh, vocabulary of skills and styles to replicate this. And I've got, a, this is a clear illustration of it. Here is a pot, basically, that, that I did from that drawing many years later. Um, this is a pot called the uh, Summer of 75. Um, but it took me ages to have the confidence, technically, to be able to uh, get the depth and variety of surface that I used to be able to get with a bit of glue and some magazine cuttings. Back to the map again, and here we have the port of psychotherapy, where one embarks to the land of dreams. And psychotherapy has been a very influential uh, force on my art over the last five years or so. Um, I used to poo-poo it along with most artists and think it was a terrible thing and it would destroy me as an artist because it would iron out all my quirks and I'd never be able to be creative again. But actually I sort of see it now as kind of cleaning out my tool shed. You know, someone's come along to me tool shed and cleaned it out. And the person of course who started it off is my wife here, Philippa, on the left. Here we are on our wedding day. Um, we've been married for uh, ages now, 13 years. and. Um, She's a psychotherapist, but she hasn't been my psychotherapist, I, I hasten to add, before the kind of uh, the UKCP comes down on me. Um, but she certainly is, you know, suggested that it might be quite a good thing for me, because I was well and truly fucked up person, really. Angry. I was a very angry person when I was younger. This was one of the first pots I made in response to psychotherapy. It's called uh, Childhood Trauma Coming, uh, Manifesting Itself in Later Life. Um, Quite a kind of, and what I was thinking about when I made that title, it wasn't like the idea of the depictions of trauma, it was the fact that art itself, the art itself for me, was a neurotic impulse. You know, the idea that uh, it's somehow rebalancing my life, making things. And I'm quite happy for that, you know, I'm quite happy I'm making a lot of money out of my disease these days. <laughs> so, uh, um, you know, if art is a neurotic impulse, that's fine. That's what I find interesting about Henry Darger is that he did this thing without any reward. He did it just for himself because that powerful urge to make things. I put this slide in because this was influential. This is uh, Bruegel's Hunters in the Snow, one of my favourite paintings. And I put this in because this was influential on one of my favourite works that I've made. This is We Found the Body of Your Child. And the basic composition of the piece I, I based on the Bruegel and the idea of hunting. And it was at the time in Britain there was this famous case of, of, a, of a, a child that was uh, murdered by a paedophile. And the press, you know, were at their most rabid. It was the most undignified witch hunt. And they actually got to the point where there were riots in streets because, the, you know, people thought there was paedophiles in their housing estates. And a, a paediatrician's house was vandalised. It got, it, it got ridiculous. And, 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 and so I made this piece really as a response to that and the idea that we're not, none of us are perfect parents. And look to yourself, look for evil in yourself before you cast the stone. And so all of the words around the top, they're like those little phrases that every parent probably says to their children at some point, you know, like, it never did me any harm, or you'll spoil him, you know. And, 
So it's like the thin end of the wedge of child abuse, really. Is that, that you know you might only be at that uh, that that, but we're all fucking up our kids in some ways. Yeah, we may not be doing it in a in the terrible way that a, a child uh, attacker does. But and then there's this woman in the centre here, who, you know, who's with the body of the child. Is she being comforted by the soldiers? on the finding the body of a child, or is she being arrested? Because 95% of child murders are done by the parents. And that's quite a chilling statistic. So in a way, I wanted to say to people, look at evil in yourself before you condemn others. And this is a piece that's very much in response to my, my experience of psychotherapy. This is a pop called, it's quite a very recent pop from my last show last year. It's called um, Assembling a Motorcycle from Memory. And it's about the kind of male psyche um, I've recognised in myself, I don't know if all men experience this, but there's that post-orgasmic moment when all things seem clear. There's that kind of moment when suddenly sex is sucked out of the equation of your thought processes. And all, I, I used to say to my wife, oh, you know, I fancy mending a watch now. <laughs> and men find comfort in the mechanical. I don't know if it's just men, but there's men find comfort in the mechanical. So what I've done, I've kind of got drawn from memory because I am a man, the, the workings of a motorcycle, and labelled them with very emotional um, dialogue to kind of highlight the kind of difference of the sort of parts of the brain that are working here. This is a quote of my mother's. <laughs> anyway, so it's like there's, there's, there's always autobiography in it, and then I drew out the Haynes Manual. Um, this is going back to something I said. This is an artist called Morton Bartlett. This is kind of going back to my teddy bear in a way. Because my teddy bear, I used to always wonder, because in my, in my childhood games, I was always my teddy bear's bodyguard. And I kind of wondered, what a, what a, what a not very glamorous sort of role to cast for myself as a child in my childhood games. And it wasn't until I saw the, this work by Morton Bartlett and heard his story that I understood what it was about. And he made these half-size models of children. He was, a, he was a, I think he was a, a salesman in the printing industry or something, not a trained artist. But he's very anatomically correct models of children, uh, usually girls, between the ages of about f sort of uh, four or five and 14. And he made all their clothes. And, but they, the models themselves weren't the end point. The, model, the, the models were just for, so he could make all these photographs. And he photographed them in perfectly ordinary settings, like on the beach, or uh, being reading on a sofa, or um, like this one, sort of bedtime. And what he was doing was assembling a family album. He was assembling his own happy childhood. As Fritz Perl said, it's never too late to have a happy childhood. And so he was doing it, subconsciously, he was doing it. And I realised how that kind of connected to me being the bodyguard of my thing, because what he did, once he'd made this album and the dolls, he made special boxes for them all, and then he put them away and kept them safe. So he had this precious receptacle of memory that was completely fictitious, but he'd assembled himself and own, his own happy past, because he'd had a terrible, terrible childhood in reality. And it, and it reminded me of myself that my teddy bear was a receptacle and I, it was very precious, so therefore I had to be his bodyguard to make sure that he was safe. This is a painting by Sargent, John Singer Sargent, called The Daughters of Edmund de Boyd. And it's one of my favourite paintings because it, it, we'll start, it's got nice crisp pinafores in it, which are a particular fetish of mine. But also, it's, it's, it's the symbolism of it is very, very powerful, I think. There's, there's these, these girls standing in front of this dark corridor in the background. And I've actually clipped off the corner of it. You can't quite see it. But there's actually a pair of vases, large vases, that are like the guardians of this dark tunnel. And then the girls, they go up in age as they get nearer to the tunnel. And the tunnel, I think, is sexuality and the darkness of adulthood and loss of innocence. And you say you've got the youngest girl in the foreground, and then the two girls hovering on the brink of puberty just at the entrance to the tunnel. And I, I sort of, I really was impressed by that painting. And so I, I, I made this partly in response to that. This is Vars called um, The Plight of the Sensitive Child. And um, I, the shape of the vase echoed the ones in the, um, it's a very large vase, it's about one metre one meter tall, maybe a bit larger than that. And, um, it was about the idea of the, the innocent, how we sort of have this sort of cliche idea of children as innocent. And 
they're not always that innocent. It can be quite a harsh environment, really. But the kind of little girl look that I like myself is a kind of symbol of innocence and how I wanted to kind of contrast that with their behaviour. So they're kind of quite rough kids, sort of with their crack pipes. <laughs> and also, I remember, I remember I, 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 the landscape that they're set in is the one around my studio. My studio is in a very ugly part of London. And I quite like that. I quite like the fact that if I need inspiration, I go out and I kind of look at the motorway and the, the kind of uh, the, the run-down housing. And this piece here is like one of those roadside shrines. I don't know if you have them over here in Australia, but when someone dies by the side of the road, but it gets knocked over or something, they, then you suddenly see this outcrop of dying bunches of flowers by the side of the road. And it sort of leads me on, really, to one of my other obsessions, which is class. I mean, I'm told here that you have a classless society. Yeah, I don't quite believe it. <laughs> but, um, so this is part of, part of my thing, it's, it's with posh there, you've got posh and all those um, awful sort of uh, English things like, we've got this new word chav now, which is a kind of catch-all term for everything we don't like about the working classes. And uh, I did this piece, it was about, this piece is called Barbaric Splendour. And it was about this idea that I love kind of lots of decoration, you might have noticed by now, and gold, and you know, everything that's seen as a little bit vulgar. And if you look back through the history of art, if you look right back to the Greeks, they used to sneer at other people. And they used to look at Eastern cultures and see how they were very sensuous and they enjoyed bodily pleasures. And they, and they, and they actually, their phrase, barbaric splendor, comes from the Greek, some Greek philosopher guy. And, um, I look back, and if you think of Puritanism, minimalism, classicism, these were all kind of like uh, aesthetics of restraint and how they look at other, you know, it's like with restraint comes moral superiority. And so it's like when you walk into one of those tiny uh, council flats filled with very patterny sofas and a large telly, it's kind of like there's, you know, you look and then you compare that to the kind of restrained art lover who has the large minimal pad with lots of room and not much. And so there's this kind of class division. And I wanted to make a piece that was about that idea of, 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 sort of very over-decorated. Because these roadside shrines, I remember reading sort of articles in the papers that said, oh, aren't they vulgar? It's like post-Diana sentimentality. And I wanted to say, no, what's so wrong about an outpouring of grief and a bit of um, sort of sentimental you know, happiness with your feeling, really? And I think there's this sort of, it's particularly in England, there's this sort of buttoned up thing, oh, well, we don't do feelings. And so there's a little sort of shrine on the top for a roadside victim. And this was a, this is a photograph I did of Claire at the site of a fire with a kind of voodoo dolly. And she's one of those women who, you know, sort of pink velour leisure suit, you know, who always look like they've just chewed a wasp. <laughs> and you see them at the school gates, you know, and they've got two emotions, fury and sentimental sort of affection. So it's like, oh, look at our Darren. Don't do that, Darren! And they've got nothing in between, you know, their, their, their emotional spectrum is black and white, basically. And that's what that woman is meant to represent, really, that kind of, I'm grieving, fuck off. <laughs> and this is a vase I did called, uh, um, I was a working class, I was an angry working class man. Past tense. Sort of like, this is me, you know, being terribly smug and post-therapeutic about it all. And uh, it's kind of chinoiserie, because I think chinoiserie for, uh, suggested to me that kind of sophisticated middle class um, at ease. This is the last section of the map I want to talk about up here. Uh, this is up towards an area on the right, top right hand of the map that's called the bleak area. And up here, there's, I've, I've, consi I've consigned these three art critics, these are three London art critics, to uh, isolation on these three islands out here. Adrian Searle thinks I'm just a lovable character. Because somebody asked me, you know, are you a serious artist or are you a lovable character? And I said, can't I be both then? You know, are they mutually exclusive? Matthew Collins thinks, he wrote an article saying, um, oh, they've given the Turner Prize to someone who isn't really a contemporary artist this year. So I thought I'd done very well here. Because I have actually never been, uh, at the point I, was in the turn, I won the Turner Prize, I'd never been in an art magazine. So I thought I'd climbed Everest without oxygen. <laughs> and then Jonathan Jones, he just outright hates my work. And, and he actually wrote an article that entitled, um, If I Had a Hammer. <laughs> So, you know, I have an uneasy relationship with the art world. 
this is a part of that one of my early pieces about the artwork. Because I, I make people sort of say that I kind of posit myself as some kind of outsider artist, and then I make work about the art world. Well, I am in the art world. You know, it's the village I operate in. I operate in the art world, and so I do make work about it. It's part of my, you know, it's, it's the lovely little sort of clique that I am in. And uh, this is called boring cool people, because this, you know. Um, Coolness, I think, is one of the most uncreative forces in our modern society. Because usually it's about making money. It's usually trying to sell gullible teenagers, you know, the latest brand name. Um, and so I find it, you know, whenever anybody says cool, my hackles slightly rise. You know, it's one of those words like spiritual. If you say it, you're probably not. This was an early response. This is a very, going back right to my early attitude. Because people ask me, why did I choose pottery? I chose pottery partly because it was kind of naff and unstylish and you know, suburban. And to actually do a piece of pottery with the word, I, you know, to, to say I'm trendy and proud was kind of like at the time I was kind of giving out a message to my, to my, to my sort of uh, jokey friends like, yeah, look, I'm this, I'm, I'm this untrendy that I can say it, you know. So it was like, and then a kind of mock artwork. It was me being terribly facetious and angry at the time, I think. 1984, that piece, so that's 21 years old. And then this is a very recent one about the art world called The Lovely Consensus. Because people ask me, you know, they say, oh, that's not art, they say. You know, they, they, they look at something like Tracy Emin's bed and they go, that's not art. And I go, well, it's not really an interesting question anymore is whether it's art or not. I think the interesting question is whether it's good art and then how is it good art? What makes something good art? And so I kind of thought about that, and I thought, well, it's a consensus of opinion amongst people in the art world. You know, it's like they decide galleries, you know, various people have various amounts of brownie points to give out. Like a place like the MCA here has lots of brownie points to give out. It's a respected institution, so it can deal out a big wad of brownie points if they approve of an artist. And so I made a list with uh, somebody at my dealers of the top 50 or so collections or events you would want to be involved with in the art world. And I put them on this very pretty vase, because I wanted to make a vase that people were just drawn to in a very kind of uncomplicated way, nice colours and patterns. Because I think there's a whole thing where people buy with their ears, collectors buy with their ears, you know, they don't actually look at the, they look at the label before they look at the artwork, and then they decide whether they're going to like it or not when they, after they've read the label. And so I wanted to make a piece that kind of was about that idea. And so there is these, the names of all these art, uh, of these art collections. And the, it was actually bought by someone who was on the pot. <laughs> I won't say who it was bought by, but he has a very large collection in Greece. <laughs> um, this is a piece I made. I went to Hereford because I made a muddle up, but I got Hereford and Hartford muddle up. Anyway, it's a long story. But I ended up in Hereford, and, and the most famous thing in Hereford is the Mappamundi. And it's a medieval 1180, I think it was done in, a map of the world. And I really, really loved it. And so I wanted to make my own Mappamundi, but I thought the Mappamundi of the London art world. So I did this piece called Balloon, where all of the galleries are churches, because it is a kind of modern secular religion in many ways. You know, people go to art, big, especially big museums, they go to feel good and feel a bit of enrichment. And the artists are saints, you know, we have kind of like, you know, crazy fools we are. We're the holy fools of the art religion. And um, so I made this sort of whole uh, thing, and we've got the Pope here, Pope Nicholas Sarota, of, uh, who, he's the guy that made the Tate Gallery the kind of huge uh, success that it is now. And then Charles Saatchi was the emperor, and blah, 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 blah. And it was like a whole map of the art world. Coming to this, me winning the Turner Prize. Now, this has been a very weird time since I did this. Um, I didn't quite know. I, when, I, when I was nominated for the Turner Prize, I thought, you know, it's every artist's dream. Um, for me, it was a sexual fantasy. Because I, I, as an artist, you know, I don't know when you have a sexual fantasy, you sort of add in a bit of realism to kind of spice it up a bit. You know, you're like you're fucking the next door neighbour or something like that, you know, in, this, in your fancy. Me, I wanted to think up a situation uh, where I was humiliated in public. <laughs> and so, uh, this is about long before I was nominated for the Turner Prize, I used to think, you know, where would, as an artist, where would I realistically be very public? I know, I win the Turner Prize and I have to pick it up wearing a little girl's dress. And this was a very big turn on for me, this idea, you know. Uh, and then, so be careful what you ask for, particularly when you're self-dating. <laughs> Here I am. And I, little was I know, here's the paper the next day, with my, and the impact of that, that picture, I think it was even on the papers over here, um, 
you know, has, has been has had untold repercussions. The power of the image, amazing. A very funny time I've had since that was published. And this is my work I made about the Turner Prize. This is called a network of cracks, and it's the um, table plan, the seating plan of the Turner Prize dinner. So it's kind of like. Uh, it, on one hand, it's like one of those Victorian silver trophies you see with like, everybody who is present, blah, blah, blah. But it's also a kind of tribal thing. It's also about uh, networking. Um, it's about, uh, I actually color coded all the names. They're all slightly different colors, the names, because it's about nepotism. So depending on how well I knew the people, uh, I, I color coded them in different colors. And, um, and, and also, people love this piece because they can look at themselves up on it, they're memorialised on it. Or the one guy who used to work for the Tate Gallery came up to me and said, you've made a monument to the fact I wasn't invited. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, you know, it's interesting to see the bold facts of it, because people have project all this kind of stuff onto the evil mafia that is the art world, and they're just out to con us. And I go, yeah, it's a mafia of Essex transvestite potters, get over it, you know. <laughs> So we come, I've come a long way since the very first pot I made. This is it. This is the first plate I made at evening classes. And I, thought, I think I set, my, set it out, really, in my, in my stall uh, fairly early on. And now, post-Turner Prize, my trademark is now Princess Wanker. <laughs> so if you're ever at a car boot sale and you see this on the pot, you know that it's post-Turner Prize. <laughs> Anyway, that's the end. Thank you. And I think we're going to have some questions down Questions, here. absolutely. We'd like to... There's uh, a mic, there's a roving mic, so wait till the mic comes round until you talk, yeah. Anything, I'm not embarrassed. <laughs> I'll even talk about technique. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, I suppose we might as well face this whole issue about, you know, you call yourself a potter, a ceramic artist. Is, are you? Do you make pots? Do you do, you know, do you use the traditional materials and all that sort of stuff? Do I? I make everything. I start with a bag of mud, right. and I okay. end up with a masterpiece. I do everything. I am completely traditional. Good because on you. As a, uh, as a, as a sort of interloper to a certain extent, I feel I have to be scrupulous. So I remember one somebody once accused me of painting my mm. pots, mm. and I was horrified, you know, yeah. because I go, you know, everything on my pot. If you buried one of my pots in the garden and dug it up in a millennia, it would still look the same, because they're totally ceramic. Okay. All the photographs and everything is all kosher. So, um, you know, my credentials are, I take the risk of ceramics. <laughs> I embrace the earth. Good on you. Thank you. Any more hands up there? Are we, are we, where are we going? This one here. I'll, I'll try Hello. something new for you. What, what, what do you think you'll be doing next? What am I going to be doing next? Is that what you said? I did, yes. Oh, uh, God. Well, I'm going to New Zealand next for the show. <laughs> and I'm, I'm exhibiting in, um, in Venice for the Biennale. I've just got a small group. I mean, I'm not kind of one of these artists who kind of overturns themselves every so often and does something new in order to attract attention. Uh, I just make the work that I fancy doing. You know, I think uh, quality is more important than innovation. Innovation is terribly overrated, I think, in the art world. Because there's a lot of artists around now that are jack of all trades. You know, do a bit of video, a bit of performance, a bit of that and that. Me, I kind of like... I do where I fancy, you know, where I take where my imagination... Prints, I love making the prints at the moment. Just make a lot of money that way as well. Um, there's a, a, a strange tension, your presentation, there's a, um, an element of flamboyance, seriousness um, and humour. Yes. Um, and the, the work is um, certainly flamboyant, but uh, the, the sense of humour doesn't come through. And I guess I'm wondering how the art world perceived this tension between the way you present and the subject matter of your work. Yeah, there's a emotional complexity there, I think. Yeah. And I quite like that. Because I think humour is tricky in art, because it can be very transient. And I 
but it's also a very creative force, I think, humour. Um, and I think that, you know, tra tragedy and comedy, they live very close. I mean, I, I, I tend not to draw people smiling on my plots, for instance, because it doesn't work. You know, you draw someone smiling and it kind of, it looks trite, like a sort of family snap. And so, I see what you mean, that, that, that thing, but I, I, you know, I present my whole person and, and I think often, what appears as a joke when I speak it appears as a very serious comment when you make when you put it on a pot. Um, and I want to make something that somebody can still enjoy the morning after they drunkenly bought it the night before. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I'm quite happy with it. And also emotional, you know, the complexity of it. I mean, I think maybe a, a, the, the humorous part of me needs um, expressing, but I don't get to make jokes on pots too much. There's a mischievousness in my work, though. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that. I was just actually wondering how um, um, your, your, your audience or the art world um, um, dealt with that tension between you and, and, and the work. Oh, I don't know. Do you think I should be a really sort of sober? I don't know. Because, I mean, uh, I think when people look at artwork, you know, they, they, there's an emotional investment on their behalf, you know, into that, into, they look at the work and they're kind of saying, um, I want to go on that journey and maybe it's to a dark place with the artist and they don't want to find out that the artist sort of dresses up in a funny costume and makes jokes, I suppose, you know. If, if Francis Bacon was kind of like really, really camp and lightweight, would, it, would he have the same kind of, you know, would he have the same impact? I don't know. I'm living in an experimental time, I don't know, you know. <laughs> I don't know, I'm just me, you know. I'm not putting it on, I can't tell you. Sorry. I haven't got a pat answer to that very good question. There's one over here. Trying to bring I, I just thought it was quite interesting talking about what embroidery, something you created that scared you, that disturbed you to look at. So I was just thinking maybe if you could talk about that a little bit more. Where am I talking to? Over here. Oh, right, yeah, yes. Um, I think it was about the, the images that I, the embroidery, the, the, is that the, the, just for me, the tension between the domestic love that often is associated with embroidery and the kind of quite harsh images that I put in there. And I felt uncomfortable. I thought I was being exploitative a bit of those images because they weren't about me personally. And so I felt, I, when I look at those pictures now, I feel a bit uncomfortable with the, with the fact that I made them almost. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's a, it's a bad piece of work. It's just that I feel, it's just giving my response, my you know, honest response to them. Um, I like, you know, I like embroidery because of the so same way that I like pottery because of the, because it's like, people ask me why I make pots or embroidery, it's because people, have everybody has a, a kind of intellectual baggage or emotional baggage they bring they have a filter that they look at the, the images through so it's like you enter a room you see pots and you go oh what nice pots and that puts us in a kind of frame of mind ready to look at them and if, if that's disturbed by the you know they, they we have an assumption of what of kind of things we might be looking at and the same with embroidery we have an ass maybe assumption of the kind of area we might be entering when we when we see the context it's in and a lot of my work is about maybe setting up a tension between those things. Because everybody, I mean, what's nice about embroidery and pottery is they're very global phenomenon. You know, most cultures have pots, most cultures have embroidery. And so everybody that looks at them has a presupposition about them. And so uh, I use that, those presuppositions. So I'm not sure about what other cultures, you know, I'm not sure what they think about things. Hi. Um, first of all, great ankles. Oh, right. Um, <laughs> secondly, um, as um, an English woman, I just wondered whether um, I noticed that, that Little Britain is now being um, shown over here. Yeah. And I wondered if that had any impact on how you were accepted or not. Well, Little Britain's quite interesting because it's the first time a comedy show has actually picked on transvestites as a phenomenon, as opposed to men dressed up as women. And they've got it kind of spot on. You know, I talk, I'm in this program I recently made for Channel 4, I actually have a clip of Little Britain on. Because they do, even though it's a gross parody, they do get it just right. They get the kind of um, old fashionedness of the clothes. Because I talk about transvestism being emotional archaeology because often the clothes are symbolic of the era when the tranny decided to become a tranny, you know, subconsciously. So they dress up as, you know, the, the clothes of their childhood. 
And so you've got um, Emily Howard, you know, the, watching it. And also the things like the tension, what loo do I go into? And it's very well observed, you know, but it's kind of a, yeah. So most trainees really laugh about it. But um, I, it, it has given ammunition for people to shout other things at you. <laughs> <laughs> That's the trouble with catchphrases, you know. One up there. Hi, I just have uh, the question I'd like to ask is, why did you choose to dress like a very young girl as opposed to just a cross-dresser? Well, I've been through kind of the... Uh, the um, I still do dress up as an older woman sometimes. It's about five or six years ago, um, I bought this bridesmaid's dress at an Oxfam shop and I sort of put it on. It really took me back to the first time I dressed up and made me kind of reconnect with a kind of... It was like I'd been toking cannabis and suddenly someone offered me some crack. It was like, it was like the kind of real raw symbolism of femininity. The kind of frilliness, the vulnerability, the, the kind of bows and lace and everything. As opposed to the kind of, nowadays the only lace and bows you get on women's clothes is a kind of postmodern reference to that, isn't it? You know, the kind of clothes have been, fashion is so intellectualized nowadays that um, it doesn't have that kind of innocence, exuberance of femininity so much these days. It's always kind of slightly ironic and, and, and uh, self-conscious. And so there's something nice about the, the little girl look that is kind of pure, um, the si pure symbolism. It's like almost like I'm kind of fetishizing a template, like the, sort of the symbol on a toilet door. It's everything that femininity represents to my subconscious. Sorry. If that answers your question. Hi, um, I've just got a really simple question. I'd just like to know your definition of the alter ego. Oh, I don't know. I wouldn't know. I don't know if I've got one. Because <laughs> people always think, call it alter ego. It's never a word I've used. I don't really, I'm not, I, I don't, I mean, I call her Claire because when you, when, uh, I call myself Claire because when I was first in a tranny organisation, they insisted that you had a feminine name. To, uh, to remain anonymous, because in those days it was much more of a sort of, sort of people wanted to be in the closet more. Um, but I don't really have an, I've never really had another role. I, I, it's, it's, I'm a bit uncomfortable with that idea. I mean, I'd even happily drop Claire, actually. It's me in a frock, deal with it, I say, you know. <laughs> Hi. Where are we going? Oh yeah, hello. Um, I personally find a lot of your works very, very moving and I was just wondering if any of your works move you to the point that you almost can't finish them or does the work's painfulness for you, it push you on even further? Um, the thoughts are, are painful to me often but then they're the thoughts. Making the work is a, sort of often a technical challenge and by the time, you know, they take a long time, sometimes several months to make uh, and if I was, you know, if I was in a state of... Uh, uh, torture about it all the time. It would be pretty difficult to work. No, I mean, I, for most of the time, I'm working on the on the on the pots. Um, I'm fairly dispassionate about the actual process, and it's a matter of being. I mean, I mean I often describe my work as masterpieces of organisation, because uh, in a lot of the technical things, it's getting things in the right order and and being belt. I'm very belt and braces technically as a potter because I can't take any risks because they're so elaborate and they take so long. I can't have it exploding in the kiln. So um, in, when I, I'm never happier than when I'm just doing a really boring job in the studio. You know, I'm re, I sort of slightly kind of collapse with relief when it's time to do something that's just going ch -ch 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 for hours with the radio on. You know, that's me. That's pleasure. It's the, the creative part is the hard bit. You know, when I actually sort of have to think up the ideas and do the drawings and things like that. It's all messy and difficult. It's where I could make a mistake. One final question. Uh, one, uh, all right, we'll have two. I'll have one down here. I was just um, interested in the map of the mind. That was a bit um, cliché, and I was hoping you'd say something about that, just what your relationship is to it. What it's a cliché. Yeah, in, in the map of the mind. I was yeah, it's what, a kind of whole area of cliché, because yeah. I think... Um, I was talking about those, 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 those words that men use, you know, those kind of like, uh, you hear, the one that really grates me is at the end of a day, people use it all, I don't know if over here they use it so much, but people say, at the end of a day it's going to mean this and this and this, and at the end of the day, I mean, I've actually heard people on the radio use it like five times in a, in a like one minute statement, and I think 
there's a, a laziness about it that I can't I, I bore. But at the same time, I know from my own experience that when you're in a, a state of heightened emotion, it's like we kind of we all um, tend to use cliches, you know. Like I've, you know, when I've, I've been confronted with some amazing sight, you go, wow, you know, that's amazing or something. And you go, well, I hate it coming out of my mouth because I kind of pride myself often on, on having something interesting to say. So, yeah, I have an uneasy relationship with cliché. And um, creatively, there's something to use, I suppose. You know, they're, they're a common language if you know that people will understand the reference point. So you've got to be aware of what's in the air. Thank you. <laughs> That's fantastic. As uh, Grace and Claire was talking, uh, using the word innovation, actually it was the word radical that was going through my mind. Um, I thought that was a fantastic lecture. I'd like to actually now, however, call on Jill Westwood, who's lecturer in art therapy at the School of Applied Social and Human Sciences at the University of Western Sydney, to say a formal thank you to our wonderful guest speaker. Thank you. Well, it's a pretty awesome task actually to say thank you to a very, very old and dear friend. To see you in such a public arena, um, so generously giving of your whole self, all what goes on inside you, all the complexity. I think of all the artists I've ever met, there's something about the way that you've led us into that and given us such a concentrated um, like smorgasbord of all the bits that somehow you're involved with and it's been a really really rare and fantastic honour I think for us to have that. Um, Phil, it's, you've been so generous and um, it's been really wonderful and I'm very very pleased that the turnout's been so good because as I said we organised it in you know really really short time and you've just been um, so ready to just go yep yeah, let's do it and you just grasping all the um, opportunity to share and contribute you know who you are what you think what you do and I think there's a real receptivity I think your work has a lot to say a, a lot to say about I guess the worlds I'm interested in which is art art therapy psychotherapy and I think it, it's yeah the world's kind of quite ready and receptive you're entertaining and you, and you give us a lot to think about and um, I'm just going to enjoy the rest of that sort of ascending star which you are. So thank you so very much, Grayson. Thank you. No, it's been lovely. Good.